stories began as pulp novels. So both of the things on the side are both covers from those pulp novels. Um, and then he slowly kind of spread from there. Now typically when I say Conan the Barbarian, people tend to think of the next slide. Our friend, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Or the picture from the poster, um, which, so in other words, him almost completely naked with a usually much more naked woman somewhere near the ground or over his shoulder. Um, and that tends to be the impression that people have. It was, in fact, my impression long before I started really reading the stories. Um, but I decided to challenge myself and see if I could find something else within them besides juvenile tales for Alice and Boys. Um, interestingly, many people had that same opinion, including some of his editors, uh, like Elspeth de Camp was actually somebody who I believe said that there was nothing of value or nothing hidden to look for, so don't bother. Um, this is the person who later went on to write his own versions. So, some people think that he kind of ruined things a little bit, um, and then he was sort of rescued, Conan was rescued later on um, in the 60s with the beginning of Tolkien and some of his. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. So that's a little bit about Howard. Uh, Robert E. Howard was his creator. He was born in 1906 in Texas. He lived in Texas most of his life. Um, he created the character of Conan in 1932, but he had created many, many characters prior to that, uh, one of whom was Cole the Conqueror, and that was a direct precursor to Conan. Uh, he also was just prolific. He wrote 300 short stories and over 800 poems. Uh, so he's kind of constantly writing. Really interesting guy. And many of his stories were featured in pulp magazines, Weird Tales being one of the foremost. Um, unfortunately, he committed suicide on June 11th of... Did I hear that? I'm not sure. It's okay. 1936. We can go to the next slide. Okay. I think I hit the track now. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. So he had a lot of interesting ideas about human civilization. And you see these in his stories, but there's also a lot of le letters where he kind of goes back and forth to his friends with these ideas. And this is the last lines of one of his more popular stories, which is Beyond the Black River. Barbarism is a natural state of mankind. Civilization is unnatural. It is a whim of circumstance. And barbarism must always ultimately triumph. Kind of a dark line. Kind of a dark story. Most of the stories were a little bit. Um, but the lines between savage and civilized in his stories are often very blurred. Um, and he uses his stories to explore these ideas that humanity is naturally inclined towards barbarism and that civilization is just always going to fall because it's just not natural to us. <clears throat> Barbarism was ultimately triumph, and he used his stories to demonstrate that belief through descriptions of his civilizations and through the use of Conan himself. So Conan's kind of a liminal character who demonstrates a lot of this. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so these are his ideas. Civilization for Howard's was a thin veneer, subject to the generation, decay, and eventual conquest. <clears throat> he also felt that civilization breeds the seeds of its own corruption and decay. So he didn't really have a positive view of civilization. Um, sorry, let me find my spot. <laughs> As you can tell, on the uh, barbarism and savagery side, he thought it was pure, a cleaner form of life, just more true, more natural. Um, he jokes in a letter that while he likes the idea of barbarianism, he wouldn't want to do that now because he was used to civilized life but if he was going to be reborn, he would want to be reborn as someone like Conan. Um, and there's no corruption. They're only the survival and inherent violence of man. Um, so I think, I think he felt that the more we're concerned with just living, the less time we have to be corrupted by things, which I suppose is true. Um, but I don't know how long we can sustain that as people. Um, and that certainly is no longer the case. So, some of these ideas seem kind of dark. Um, 
Um, I know when I was reading it, I was kind of surprised that he would have such a dim view of the lives we live as humans. Um, but if you look at some of the context around him, it makes a lot of sense. Let's make it the next slide, please. Howard was writing in the Great Depression, right in the middle of it. Um, <clears throat> 1932, a lot of uncertainty and fear. Uh, depression hadn't even reached its lowest point, and it was gonna be several years before anything even started to improve. Um, the value of food was continuing to drop. The Dow Jones hit its lowest level since prior to this, since the start of market crash in 29. And then the dust storms began um, in 1932, oh. and they formed the Dust Bowl. And since he was in Texas, he would have been exposed to this quite a bit. And I feel like, the dust storms in particular create this sense of everything falling down. Um, the nation was literally crumbling beneath their feet, and there wasn't anything they could do. The government, they were mostly just trying to save their face rather than helping people, but they kind of helped people. <coughs> um, not a lot of compassion for those out of work, and there was a lot of greed. It's a great time if you were an employer. It could be really, really awful. <clears throat> and because of the issues with the government, self-sufficiency was encouraged more. And it was a lot a bigger, even more so than now, I think, lack of trust in the government. So <clears throat> out of this steps Conan. He's self-sufficient. He's nicely balanced between the two. He's not, you know, out rampaging the wilderness, but he's also not, you know, falling down at the second things don't start to go well, which I think is probably, in my opinion, how Howard might have been seeing things. <clears throat> he also tends to help governments rather than giving into it or using it. Usually he just passes through, sometimes helps them, sometimes scoffs at their demise and continues on his way. <clears throat> uh, can I get the next slide, please? So there's three tales I'm gonna talk about. Um, two of them are pretty famous and very popular, versus Red Nails, which is one of the ones that demonstrates very well his ideas of what civilization becomes and what barbarism kind of happens. Um, the next one will be Beyond the Black River, and the last will be The Shadows of Zamula. <clears throat> so to give you a quick little summary, because you kind of need to know. Uh, in this story, after following Valera of the Red Brotherhood, who is a pirate woman that he liked, Conan discovers an abandoned city. Oddly, the entire city is indoors with long hallways and streets. He and Valeria discover two very small tribes of dark peoples who live there and are in a terrible blood feud that has wiped out about 90% of their population. They side with one group, mostly because that's the first group they ran into, as far as I can tell. There didn't seem to be any other reason. <clears throat> Help them fight off and kill the rest of the other people. In the process, most of that tribe is killed as well. So by the time they're done, it's like them and like one dying person. <clears throat> uh, Valeria is then snatched by the king and queen of the group to be sacrificed so the queen can stay young forever. They defeat them and manage to get out of the city and back into the forest, which at that point seems far less dangerous despite being full of dragons. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So, when they first, they're on like an island area and they're just sort of traveling along with each other. And unfortunately, you can't see it very well. Um, that's a pretty good depiction of them running into this dragon. Uh, but I tend to think of this in a circle. Basically, there's one big circle of wilderness all around it. And that was what had the dragon, which is really more of a dinosaur. Uh, but that's what they call it. He kills it and they continue moving towards the city that they can see in the distance. Outside the city is a large open area where um, what was once fields have been left to kind of go foul and sort of go back to wilderness. <clears throat> and this confuses Conan. He says, no cattle, no plowed fields. How do these people live? So at this point, for Conan, his idea of civilization right now is people who, they farm. You know, they still need to get from the earth, they need to interact with people, they have to be somewhere. And he doesn't yet know that there's almost no one in this city. So not seeing the villagers and people taking out the land would have been really confusing. Uh, when they get to the actual city doors, again, nothing's there, no one's there, no one shouts down the challenge. 
No helmets or spearheads gleamed on the battlements. No trumpets sounded, no challenge rang from the towers. A silence as absolute as that of the forest brooded over the walls and minarets. <clears throat> so this is clearly an abandoned place. And it's extremely foreboding before they're even in the door. <clears throat> an empty city, or a ghost city, is a sign of a city that has fallen, which means there is a civilization in the past that fell with it. <clears throat> you also learn that later, later on, that the wilderness around the city was actually filled with these dragons, who also fought themselves into oblivion until it was just this one lone one running around that cut and eventually kills. So very much mirroring what's happening inside, even though you don't find that out until a little bit later. But the people inside have basically become the dragons that were outside. Okay, the next slide. So they get in the city, and I love this city. My favorite thing of this entire story is this city. It's so cool. I love the idea of this city that's just entirely indoors. But it's kind of a creepy city. It's made entirely of precious and semi-precious stone, particularly jade, lapis lazuli, and jasper, or carnelian. Um, and it has a really sinister feeling, and it's still mostly empty. It's starting to fall into ruin a little bit, so some of the plants are kind of coming in and that kind of thing. Uh, the floor seemed to smolder as if with the reflection of flames. Uh, the floor is not actually explained what it's made out of. I just, it sounds like Jasper or Cardinalian to me. <clears throat> Sorry. So this opulence kind of creates this weird cold feeling despite the warm floor because that's not the kind of warmth that makes you want to curl up with a book. It's the kind of warmth that is maybe like walking across coals. It's not a welcoming warmth. Um, the opals, oops, not there yet, sorry. So as they're walking along, um, the walls are jade, and so on the ceiling is lapis, and then there's opals studded, studded along the ceiling. So they're like into the eyes of angry cats, and as they continue down this street, uh, their progress is described as being like treading the floors of hell with evil stars blinking overhead. So this is clearly a really negative place. It's a sinister, dark, forbidding city. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. And the elbows in the ceiling are described as gleaming with a poisonous radiance. And Conan comments that while the stones would have lit the halls at night, it would have been a hellishly weird illumination. So. And again, it's not a great, can't really see it very well, but this is a really cool art, concept art someone did because they were going to make this into a movie and never did. Excuse me. Um, so one of the things of this city is, first of all, it's not welcoming. This is a city that was built for intimidation, to oppress and to intimidate. Um, they were interested more in appearances, and people who were interested in comfort, or even utility, wouldn't have used this kind of thing for their walls, or frightening and hellish floor. They would have had something a little more normal, maybe a more welcoming, regular, normal stone, which may be cold, but not to be used to it. <clears throat> um, it's an example of misused wealth, which is something that tends to occur when there's just too much. There's so much wealth. Whatever civilization built the city must have been at what Howard saw as the height of corruption because they just wasted their wealth um, and cut themselves off from the world. <clears throat> Walls of jade and a ceiling of lapis obviously indicate an ungodly amount of wealth. I mean, think about how much wealth you would have to just make your entire city out of jade. I think that's just unimaginable in my opinion. So this was obviously a society that could just waste all their precious materials on their structures. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So a city that's mostly interested in appearances is mostly an empty city. And so it stands to reason that the people within would also have been only interested in appearances, and therefore also empty. <clears throat> As you go along and you meet the people in the fight, they kind of tell a little bit of a story about the city, where initially the people who made it um, are all gone. They've all died out. They were killed by their own slaves. 
uh, but they've learned how to make food from the air. Um, they didn't have to grow anything anymore, and so they just shut their walls and lived inside growing their own natural fruit. And so they kind of lost themselves. Um, Howard would have seen that as, you know, extremely unnatural. <clears throat> and they got lazy, of course, since you don't have to go and till the fields anymore. You can just kind of sit around and do whatever you want. And there's not a lot of books in here anymore, so I'm guessing they didn't read. Although, who knows? <clears throat> so, once the first group is overthrown by their slaves, the slaves then sort of take their place. And they split into two tribes, um, each led by a brother. And then this woman shows up, and both brothers want her. And so they end up separating and fighting and going off into extremes. So I personally see this as something along the lines of the Trojan War, where Helen was the one, you know, she was taken and it was, they were going to take Helen back and save Helen, but really it was just a power play and Helen was just sort of the excuse. And I feel like this is very similar to that. Uh, the brothers wanted more power, and so it just evolved into this blood feud where they would constantly go back and forth, killing each other tit for tat, until there's almost nothing left. <clears throat> and that blood feud is a result of these people just sort of giving in to their more barbaric animal natures. Uh, next slide, please. So this is one of the quotes from one of the people who is left in the city. I was born in it. All in this chamber were born in it. We expect to die in it. So at this point, these people have no other knowledge of life as anything other than just above animal fighting. So whatever the city was in terms of civilization, they're now at a level of savagery. The, the city is kind of just the shelter, and that's about it. <clears throat> Basically, these people have converted to their natural state because of power or greed or however you want to look at it. Uh, next slide, please. So I feel like these people, um, the city and the people in general, demonstrate the barbarian is always ready to invade and conquer. The walls will not hold forever and the gates will eventually and inevitably be broken wide. And so this is a case where the barbarian was inside. He didn't have to break down the walls because all he had to do was break down the people. And it's just the nature inside of humans that led to that breakdown. <clears throat> and so I feel like Red Nails with this city that you don't actually get to see the original civilization that was so corrupt, but you see what's left, which is this creepy, opulent city. Um, because civilizations won't last forever, but a lot of times the things they build last a lot longer. Um, and then over time, despite what was what they created, they devolved into just people fighting. Um, and that's all because of that corruption, which we don't really get to experience, but you see through what's left behind. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So that story is great at kind of demonstrating these ideas of savage, civilized, etc. But it doesn't really demonstrate Conan's ability to move between the two. So in many stories, he's often described as being closer to the savages he fights than the civilized men he fights for. And being able to balance between the two worlds while remaining true to his barbarian self, he is the ideal man in Howard's vision. So that first picture um, is a very famous Frazetta drawing where he's, you know, aside from not fighting, he's full barbarian. He's just wearing a loincloth, got a lot of spikes, weapon you know, full-on savage. The other one, which again, I'm sorry, it's hard to see, um, is King Conan. So he's sitting on a throne. He's still somewhat barbaric in terms of like, you know, he's still wearing fur and it's a fairly basic armor set. Um, but he's much more civilized. You know, this is a recognizable scene of a king. What is funny about that is it took me forever to find that. Um, it's extremely difficult to find images of Conan in a civilized fashion. Um, I think what appeals to people the most about him is his savagery. And so all the pictures you tend to find of him are him in a loincloth fighting, even though in the stories he's usually always in full armor, or at least leather, unless he gets captured. Um, 
And so that's just kind of an interesting thing about, I guess, us in terms of what appeals to people. They're more interested in the savage side, I guess, because we don't see it as much, maybe. Just a possibility. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. All right, so beyond the Black River, also a very popular um, and famous story. It's also considered one of the best that Howard ever wrote. And it is where I think Conan really shines in his ability to move back and forth between these two worlds of civilized and savage. So in this story, a young man, Balthus, is traveling through the jungle to a nearby fort on the edge of Pictish land. Uh, the Picts are a race of people in the Conan stories who are they're kind of small and dark and very loosely based on the Picts of history. Uh, but they're usually these savage tribes that he runs into. <clears throat> Balthus meets Conan, who's investigating some deaths. Uh, which have been caused by a supernatural force. Uh, it turns out the Picts have joined forces in their tribes and they're planning a revolt. And they're using this demon to achieve that um, against these Aquilonians and they're encroaching on Pictish land. Very classic story. Um, Balthus offers to help and he joins Conan in his investigations. They're eventually captured by these Picts and are about to be sacrificed to a demon, but Conan manages to rescue them and they get away. Uh, the rest of the story is spent with them trying to get back to the fort to warn the people there of the uprising. They don't succeed, um, but Balthus sacrifices himself so that Conan can continue on and save everybody back past the fort. One of the things that's really striking um, about this story is that it's told primarily from Balthus's point of view. So most of the kind of stories, they're all done in a third-person narrative. Like, that's always the same. As far as I can tell, that might be a story I'm not aware of. Uh, but the Howard stories tend to be in this third-person narrative. Um, but it's usually from Conan's point of view. So it's omniscient narrator telling you everything Conan's thinking and doing, with occasional insight from other characters. In this case, you don't get a lot of what Conan is thinking or doing, just what he's doing that Balthus can see. Um, and the entire thing is told from his point of view. And I think that's due primarily because we're supposed to see Conan as Balthus sees him, with this sort of like impressive just awe of like this character who's so intimidating and unique. Um, and so he wants to kind of pass that on to his readers. Uh, next slide, please. So when Balthus first meets him, Conan sort of just pops up in front of him. He's just been attacked and Conan saves him from this person. And you get this description of Conan standing in the forest. Um, and he, you know, he kind of scans him and he sees his helm. And he says, no civilized hand ever forged that headpiece, nor was the face below it that of a civilized man. Dark, scarred with smoldering blue eyes, it was a face as untanned as the primordial forest which formed its background. So I don't think Howard could have put it better in terms of telling us that Conan belongs in the forest. So his face isn't civilized, he's not civilized. We're supposed to see him as this sort of wild man who, you know, sprang like a forest god from the primordial forest. <clears throat> he's like a prehistoric savage from before our civilization. And so we start the story off with that idea in our head, this image of him. <clears throat> uh, yeah, next slide. But you would think Given that description, he wouldn't say much, or he might talk in grunts or point to things. Like, you wouldn't get the impression that he knows much. But Conan's actually pretty articulate. Um, he comments on the situation at the fort. This colonization business is mad anyway. There's plenty of good land east of the Bostonian marches. And so that speaks to an understanding of civilization. He understands what these civilized people are looking for, why they're trying to take these lands, even offers a possible solution. Obviously, we don't have the information, maybe he's simplifying it, but it's still not something you would expect from someone who had just been described as a primordial forest man. <clears throat> and that's where you sort of start to see that he can kind of go between the two. <clears throat> he also has uh, other knowledge of civilized things. He sort of knows how these merchants operate. Um, he can help with some tactical issues that are weakening the fort. Uh, and he has the respect of the fort commander, who has learned the unwisdom of discounting wild men's instincts. Um, so Conan is, the savage is privileged a bit for Conan, like, 
Howard's offering a balance, but he does kind of push it towards the savage, um, which you can see by the descriptions, and then also because the civilized people around Conan sort of defer to him. <clears throat> He also moves well in the wild. Obviously, he popped up in front of Alvis without him even hearing him. Um, the way he moves is kind of an indicator of his ability to move seamlessly in the wilderness. So when he and Alvis are fleeing, he avoids clinging briars and low-hanging branches effortlessly, gliding between trees without touching the stems. And the thing that's funny about that quote is they're running. They're flat out running. But somehow he's gliding between the, the leaves, you know, which is, those two images don't work well in my head. <clears throat> and so, it's almost as if the wild is where he naturally belongs. It's kind of reminiscent of a jungle cat, and there's several places where he is compared to a jungle cat. But he can also operate perfectly fine within the fort. You know, he doesn't stand out. He's not, you know, half naked in the fort. He's just a dude. <clears throat> and he kind of operates in there with a little bit of power, so the commander defers to him a little bit, so he kind of takes over. And he's sort of directing these uh, soldiers that are there, and he has them bring in this body that he found, which is headless, and they're throwing up and just really freaked out by this headless body. And his response is, have you never seen a headless body before? Uh, and he says it testily, as if headless bodies are something that are completely normal to him. And they probably are. And so this is this really unique, interesting moment where He's in a civilized area with civilized people, but he himself is not civilized. He's operating perfectly well within it, but at the same time, that innate barbarism and savagery is still there, just in the way that he can be completely calm and nonchalant about a headless body, which I think, <clears throat> even with soldiers, I think civilized people tend to not really see very often. It also shows how he's a little more savage than he is civilized, and that sort of privileging of that, uh, since he can deal with a headless body with indifference. But there's a very strong moment when he and Balthus are running away that I feel puts him in this perfectly balanced moment of being both civilized and savage. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> as he and Balthus are escaping the pick to snatch them, they get pursued by panthers and other animals. Um, and so, once they figure that out, Conan finds a place and draws a symbol in the sand. Um, and then when the panther finds that symbol, studies it for a minute, turns around, and then Balthus and Conan don't get bothered again. So, what's interesting is in this moment when he's drawing this thing in the dirt, he's telling Balthus about it as if he's giving this matter of fact history lesson. So he's sitting there drawing this savage symbol from a savage tribe right in the ground. I saw it carved in the rock of a cave no human had visited for a million years. Later I saw a black witch finder of Kush scratch it in the sand of a nameless river. He told me part of its meaning. It's sacred to Jebel Sag and the creatures which worship him. And so, on the one hand, that shows that he's obviously spent time with savage people. So in the same way that he's able to work easily in, among civilized people, he can also spend time with savage people. It's not clear if that's all fighting, um, but being able to have knowledge about who they worship and like what symbols on their bows mean and things like that, which he demonstrates in the story, I think all of that indicates that he's spent some time with these people as a, one of them. Like He has knowledge about them that he can only get by being a part of their lives. Um, and so the symbol is one of them. But that moment, he's operating within the savage world. He's being chased by a cat. Um, he's drawing something in the dirt. Like, there's not a civilized feeling there. And yet he's, you know, imparting information with all this knowledge and, like, wisdom of, you know, a wise man in a castle. Um, and so it's just this really kind of funny and, like, perfect moment of being both. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So, Beyond the Black River offers those insights of sort of how he balances between the two, and there's other examples as well, but that one I feel kind of does it the most strongly. <clears throat> but something you notice when you're reading these things, or I noticed, I should say, is there seems to be a sort of tier of civilization in Howard's books. And so, if you put Conan at the top, at the pinnacle, he's perfect ideal, he's right in the middle, 
is what you should strive for. And then as you go down, there's two other levels on each side. So on the civilized side, you have the fairly normal civilized people. They're agrarian, uh, they tend to follow a single leader, excuse me, they're allies, sometimes they're enemies. Um, usually they're allies. And those people he works with well, removes among them, no problem. Um, and then further down the tier, so to speak, is the corrupted civilization. And these are civilizations that are the extreme wealth, so whoever owned that city at the beginning, that's that civilization. And they're always lazy and sitting around doing nothing, um, usually very isolated. That's sort of the height of a corrupted civilization for Howard. And then on the other side we have levels of savagery. And similar to the civilized, we have the fairly normal savage people. They're usually hunter-gatherers, they're very tribal. Um, they are more often enemies, but they are also sometimes allies. And he can operate in both whichever direction he needs to go. Um, they are a little more superstitious and tend to use black magic, um, not above the occasional sacrifice, which I think is another way they differentiate the two. Otherwise, they're kind of similar in my opinion. And then you have extreme savagery. These people are more like animals. They're usually well into black magic and they're almost always cannibals. Um, and this level is something I haven't discussed yet and you don't see a lot. Um, and it's something I'm gonna bring up in a second. Next slide, please. Oh, so Shadows and Zambula is the third story. It's very short, um, but it has this worst or lowest level of savagery um, within it. And so in this case, <clears throat> let me jump to it, sorry. He ends up in this city, and somehow he just, all he has is his sword and the money he's, he got from selling his horse. So he's kind of hard up right now. <clears throat> Meets a merchant guy who's like, hey, stay at my house. And then a vagrant comes up to him and is like, no, don't stay there, there's a demon there, you're gonna get killed. And then Conan's like, hey, whatever, stays at the guy's house. Um, and then as he's sleeping, this monstrous man shows up and tries to take him away. He fights him and gets away. And as he's running away and leaving, um, he runs into a group of these same kind of hulking men attacking a, obviously, stark naked woman. Because, <clears throat> you know, it's a clown story, what else is she gonna be, right? <clears throat> so he saves her. And so she sees an opportunity and basically manipulates him into or convinces him, I guess we could say, into helping her. So she's like, I need your help with my lover, I need, I need to get rid of this guy who is into me, and I need to get my ring back from him. <clears throat> and if you do that for me, you can have me. So he goes along with her, um, helps her, and does everything she asks. And at the end, she's like, well, yeah, actually, you can't have me, but here's some gold. Um, so he takes the gold and goes away, but he also steals her ring in the process. That's sort of the end of the story. Um, so it's a pretty basic story, kind of a funny one. But what I find interesting is these hulking men who attempt to snatch Conan and try to kill her. <coughs> uh, next description, please, or er, slide. So these men are the lowest extreme. The example I have in the picture there is not from this story. It was just the best example I could find of what I think this would look like. So there's this huge, very ape-like thing. Um, so he's. This thing that tries to steal him is described as having a great black bulk, broad, stooping shoulders, and a mishappened head blocked out against the stars. And then it's described as having a crouching posture and a shambling gait. So certainly very animal-like from the beginning. Um, you find out that he's from this nearby tribe of cannibals. And they roam the streets at night looking for anyone they can catch unawares. And he also encounters a group of these men later and they're described in very much the same way. Uh, the term monstrous is used a lot as well. So these are obviously, they're people, but they're also kind of not. They're much closer to monster and animal. And you can also really see that in the way um, they, well, so to speak, talk. The way they're described as communicating. Um, they're either completely silent in like a creepy way, like there's just, there's no response. Um, or in one instance, when trying to flee, one of the men is described as bellowing like an ox in the yellow in the slaughter yards. Um, so very, these silence and animal sounds are indicative that these people are closer to animals than they are to humans. 
Um, and then they're described as making more animal sounds in other areas, and also as apes and beasts. Uh, the queen lady describes them as black men, like great hulking apes. Um, and since they're cannibals, basically at this point, once you eat your fellow human beings, you're off the deep end. You're too far into the savage world. You've just become, you've given in completely to the animal. And so Howard, with these people, is saying, this is too far. You want to be where Conan is. You don't want to be all the way down here where you're eating people, because that's just completely off the deep end. <clears throat> Something I do want to point out or address is, this is also one of the more racist stories. Um, there's a lot of racism in the Conan stories. So if you're looking for something to pursue, that's a possibility. Um, <clears throat> so every time I look at this, it makes me uncomfortable because it feels very purposeful in this story in particular as some sort of commentary. Um, so I don't know. That's just something that I thought I'd point out. Like, I'm aware that's there, so just, you know. <laughs> All right, next one, please. All right, so Conan, like I've said, he's the pinnacle, he's the balance, he's the perfect thing in the center. And you can see it when we outline it like this. So Conan's civility, he obviously has his civil side. He can converse easily and knowledgeably. He's willing to work with and among civilized people. Uh, he does not rape or pillage, um, partly because the women are always willing, obviously. Um, <laughs> but also because he's just not I think that's also sort of in the thing of like being too far. And he likes wealth, but he doesn't want extreme wealth. He doesn't want to make his house out of gold kind of wealth. But he has a lot of scorn for people who are on that far level of civilized. So in Beyond the Black River, they're complaining about a city further away who won't help them. And he's like, yeah, I know the breed. <coughs> Soft-bellied fools sitting on velvet cushions with naked girls offering them ice wine on their knees. I know the breed. They can't see any further than their palace walls. So he doesn't have much respect for them either. They're obviously useless, I think, in his opinion, just sort of soft and not worth, he doesn't want to be that. Um, and while I haven't had a chance to read the stories where he's a king, um, from what I understand, he's often, he really chafes in that position. Doesn't like sitting around doing nothing or ordering people around. He really likes to be out and doing. And I think that's also sort of indicative of like, Howard thinking humans should be doing things, not sitting around. <clears throat> and then on the savage side, he has tribal knowledge. He certainly doesn't shy away from gruesome sights. Um, he's a fierce fighter, so he's awfully, off, often um, creating those gruesome sights. He's very self-reliant um, and extremely adaptable. So no matter where he is, he's gonna survive. If he's in the wealthy area, he'll do what he needs to do to get there, and if he's in the middle of the forest, he'll be just fine in both cases. But he doesn't stoop to the lowest level. He never lets his animal nature completely control him. And I think having these people who never speak and are just like animals, I think they're to sort of demonstrate that, yeah, okay, so he's a little more savage than he's civilized, but he's not these people. Um, and so these are both kind of nicely balanced. He's somewhere in between those. Uh, next slide, please. So be yourself, unless you can be Conan then be Conan. Thought I'd steal that from the Batman one. <laughs> but in the end, civilization is not man's natural state. Uh, and it's always going to fall. Certainly history has shown us that civilizations always fall. Um, <clears throat> Howard uses these decadent civilizations and stories to demonstrate that. But on the other hand, man cannot go too far into the world of the savage, lest he risk losing himself to his own animal nature. Instead, man must be like Conan, liminal moving between both spaces. Man must move between savage and civilized in order to live the best life. Humans require a balance between the two. And Conan is the representative ideal of what that balance should look like. Um, humans must be alert and strong, but they also need to be able to discuss politics and be literate. In other words, we need to have the strength and the savagery, but we also have to be able to talk and communicate in order to move forward in certain areas. Conan is Howard's purest form of man, and the ideal of which all men should emulate. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions? I think we got some time. So, 
Uh, maybe, maybe more on your technique of how you went through the books. Did you go through the books and this stuff kind of came to you, or were you looking for these certain highlights? What was? Well, what initially happened was I was actually looking for I was looking at the racism angle, um, and I was sort of trying to find something with that, and just sort of. Um, my husband's a huge collector, and he has like almost every book ever written about Conan. <laughs> and so I took one from him that I knew had been written by Howard, because that's sometimes hard to find. And I read through all three of those, which were these. Um, and while there was the racism thing, it just wasn't really standing out to me. What was standing out to me was this civilization savagery thing. Um, and then I sort of started to follow the threads of that and look for the sources and things to sort of support that. Okay. Um, so it was, yeah, it was more of a discovery than an intentional uh, thing. Do you think that uh, Robert E. Howard kind of intended to put that in the books then? As Because I know his books were originally sold as kind of like a fantasy, get away from the troubles of the Depression kind of a thing, but I've never seen it from that angle before. I'm wondering if he did that on purpose. or. Um, it's interesting because I think one of the articles I was reading said that he said it was just stories. Um, so maybe not consciously, but I feel like considering all the letters and the back and forth he had with friends about this stuff, I feel like it just happened, it just got in there. Um, so maybe not intentionally, but I feel like once you're looking for it, it's really hard to ignore. So, couldn't tell you. <laughs> but it definitely sounds like he didn't think so. No, but I mean, the, just the, the point you brought up seems so obvious now that, you know, you, you show him like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's weird. Um, it was really fun to do. Yeah. So is he a noble savage in the traditional kind of like romantic sense, or is he higher than the noble savage in the sense that he's uh, more articulate and more, you know, able to, like he knows about plowing fields and stuff? <laughs> um, I guess they would put him a little higher. Okay. Um, I definitely think the noble savage absolutely influences the character. Because, um, yeah, I mean, Howard's obviously romanticizing this whole savage thing. Like, he obviously probably didn't, maybe didn't even go camping, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, since he's not just out in the forest, I feel like he's probably, again, something somewhere in the middle um, with his sort of extra knowledge um, and being adaptable. He's very adaptable. Noble, but not quite virtuous. Yes, he's not virtuous. <laughs> no, no, not virtuous. <laughs> or more, I guess he's not going to say no to options that come up. <laughs> put it that way. And yes, that's also a discussion that could be had, too. Um, although there wasn't as much sexism as I thought there was going to be. Um, but it's there. It's just... The covers tell a very different story, in my opinion, than, than what's in the actual stories. If you didn't ever read it, I know. You would never know. And I actually, when I pulled, one of the pictures I pulled from a, a website that had all these pulp novel drawings, and there was a particular artist. Um, she did the Weird Tales, uh, Red Nails one. And uh, the way she did it was so popular because it was so scandalous that uh, writers would add in unnecessary scenes of like sex or violence just to try to get on the cover <laughs> with her art. Marketing. Yeah, so it's sort of funny that the marketing aspect of this very much privileges and really plays up that whole savagery thing. I'm like, I, in all three of those stories, never once was he completely naked or down to a loincloth. Like, he always had at least pants. Um, so that was very kind of just amusing to me through the whole thing. Uh, so, you know, if you were to look at the covers, you would never catch any of that. Any other questions? Did you ever jump into the graphic novels? No, and it's funny looking, going back through this, I'm kind of like, maybe I should make my dissertation on this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd be curious to look at some of the uh, comics and graphic novels. Um, I, one of my friends sent me this thing of all these covers, I think all of the Marvel covers that they'd ever done. And he actually picked up a couple of female sidekicks, so I think that might be an interesting exploration. Apparently Red Sonja came out of that, which I didn't know. Um, so. There's actually yeah, there's a lot of rich stuff. It's just I didn't want to read any of the Alice Bragg de Camp stories because he just seemed so down on him. And I'm like, well, I want to read what was actually written by Howard to get a real idea of what this character was supposed to be versus what he was created and made into later. So, can make a cool comparison. Yeah.
Now, I know he's, he's written some other books, now that I think about it, that where the characters start from the more civilized side, like Conan is, you know, starts from the savage side and then learns to live within civilization. But he's got characters in other books that kind of go the opposite direction as well. Oh, really? Yeah, he's got a noble woman, that, or maybe not a noble woman, the daughter of a soldier. And this is during, you know, the, the French Revolution time. Huh. where she kind of like breaks away from her father, breaks away from tradition, and goes and does her own things, and gets into her own adventures, and becomes kind of savage herself. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, so, and he has a, another one, it's kind of like sci-fi, where this one guy, he's a, he's a big guy, he's in the 20s, and he accidentally kills a man, like in a bar fight. Didn't really mean to kill him, but he's just that strong, and now the law's gonna like come and take him away, and this one scientist, sends him to a more savage world where he can survive, you know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. I appreciate it. Playing Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right, yeah. Maybe I stole it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.